Um, we're going to record this discussion um, and upload it onto the Out of Orbit Festival website, just so that it can be available for anyone who couldn't make the live event this morning. So it'll be on the festival website for the next few months. Um, you're more than welcome to have a watch back if you would like to and to share it with anyone else who you think might be interested. Um, please do feel free to do that. Um, you will have noticed that cameras and microphones are disabled for attendees for the discussion today, um, but we will have a Q&A towards the end of the discussion, probably after about maybe 45, 50 minutes or so, we'll see how we go. Um, so if you'd like to submit any questions to the panel, please do. There's a Q&A function, it should be at the bottom of your screen. Um, so you can pop your questions in there throughout and I'll try and get to as many of them as I can in the Q&A. Um, but also if you'd like to ask your question directly, you can actually put your name into the Q&A and I'll be able to unmute you. So you can, you can speak to the panelists directly and ask the question if you so wish. Please feel free to do that. Um, if you have any technical issues um, at all, there's also a chat function and our lovely stage manager, Karen, is working away invisibly behind the scenes. So if you have any issues, feel free to drop her a message um, into the chat and she'll do her best to help you out. Um, I'm just going to check our attendees there now. Lovely. I think we have almost everyone tuned in, which is great. So um, thank you to my panelists for joining. Um, I'm really delighted that you could all be here today. Um, and I'll quickly introduce you all. Um, before I come to you all, we have Ashley McGorman, uh, Creative Art Manager at The Arc. Um, we have George Hanover, Program Director of The Og. Um, Lally Morris, Director, Facilitator, Mentor, Advisor, and former Artistic Director of Bavro Arts Festival. And of course, Fiona Kelleher, um, Early Years Musician and uh, mastermind behind early bird music <laughs> uh, based in Cork. Thank you all so much for mm -hmm. joining us. Um, it would be really lovely to start um, just by getting a little bit of uh, information from all of you. And I might start with you, Ashling, um, to just give us, I suppose, a brief overview of your own background and specifically what brought you to early years work uh, when you first became aware of it, I suppose, and what led you to be working in the area today. Uh, thanks, Saif, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here this morning. So, uh, yeah, for me, my background is actually music, uh, like Fiona. So I um, started my career as a freelance practitioner, and um, I did a master's in Limerick in community music. And when I came fresh out of that bursting with enthusiasm. We'd been very much encouraged to kind of try lots of things and work with lots of different age groups and different types of groups, which was brilliant advice actually. So I kind of was very gung-ho about that. And around the same time, my sister was setting up her own preschool. Um, and I had a friend who was doing a lot of work in that age group. So I actually started to run um, uh, my own workshops for that age group. So that's where it really began. But uh, over time, more and more I started getting uh, work I suppose as a programmer and um, yeah my career started kind of moving in that direction and eventually I ended up getting a full-time job at the ARC um, initially as music programmer. Uh, my job now is much more broad so it still includes music but I'm working across the full breadth of the program um, which is multidisciplinary and the ARC um, is a children's a dedicated children's cultural centre in Temple Bar um, as I know, the only one of its kind in Ireland uh, still. And um, around, well, at the very beginning, the ARC, way before my time in 1995, when the doors opened, it was uh, for four to 14 year olds. That was the age limit. But around 2005, 2006, um, that was changed. So we started to kind of work with uh, preschool age children as well as primary school. So it's since then, it's been two to 12. So obviously, there's a big focus there. For us, particularly the kind of two to five year olds would be sort of our main early years audience. So I suppose formally in a programming capacity, um, it's really since I started working at the ARC that I suppose I've really been doing a lot of that kind of early years work as a programmer. So that's that's my background in, in very short terms. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And it'll definitely uh, I'd love to chat to you a little bit more about the programming at the ARC um, later on. 
but uh, first I might come to Fiona um, and hear a little bit from you, Fiona, on uh, similarly your background and what brought you to uh, earlier's work. Uh, thanks, Ive, and hi, everybody. Good morning. Lovely to be here. Um, so I suppose it was more of an organic start for me in some ways. Again, I mean, I, my background is in music as well. Um, and as a singer primarily, and I did a lot of touring as a traditional vocalist with a band and did lots of recording and that kind of thing. So that was coming from a more kind of performative space, I suppose. But also with that, I mean, as all musicians know, you have to have many strings to your bow. So I was also doing a bit of teaching and working a bit in schools. And um, I also had three very young children. So they were kind of influencing me greatly. So we were making up lots of silly songs at home and that kind of thing. So there was a lot of improvisation happening at home as well as in the school thing. And then of course, traditional music is really, there's a lot of improvisation in that in terms of people putting their own creative identity in songs and music and so on. So that was there very much in the mix. And then I was invited to be on the Biog programme, I suppose it was 2010 with George Hanover and Inge van Dusseler. So we were the kind of initial team working in there. So that put more of a structure, I suppose, on the work, which had been much more, I suppose, fluid and organic and not particularly geared to early years, but just to doing what was what was coming at me really without any particular aim in mind. So that was the first time I suppose I got to really kind of develop and think about the work in terms of creating experiences for the youngest audience in that way. Um, and also working with artists in theatre and in visual arts, which was a joy and such a privilege to be able to kind of be a support and be supported by those other disciplines um, through the programme. So an awful lot of development happened there, but I suppose as a musician, what I'd say is the tools that really developed for me over that time, which were there very much in my music anyway, was improvisation. That was really key. And still is very much, I mean, that sense of playing everything that you find, I suppose, that you witness in theatre, much more maybe in music in a more kind of a, I suppose, in, in an obvious way, um, became very much part of what I did. So I was very influenced by George and by Inge in that regard, um, that sense of play. So that became very strong, which I'm really grateful for, actually, to the Globe programme for that and all the great experiences that we've had. So that's kind of the background. That's where I came from. I'm not in the Bureau, I, I left the Bureau program since, but that was very much kind of formative, I suppose, for me in terms of my development as an early years artist. Um, but it seems like now a very obvious path from where I seem to be kind of going on that path anyway, without any particular conscious decision until I landed in that. And then it was, yeah, I got all the necessary kind of, uh, I suppose, supports and inspiration that led me to where I am now. So, yeah. Great. Yeah. Which is, is so often the way, isn't it? An organic path seems to find its way Absolutely. to you. Absolutely. Um, great. Thank you, Fiona. Um, Lali, I might come to you next. It would be lovely to hear a little about your background and what brought you to the work, to earlier years work specifically, I suppose. Mm. I have to go way back. It's, I think it starts with have, being from a very big family and having <laughs> very young siblings that we had to all find, you know, to take care of. And in a way, just exploring lots of things with them, whether they wanted to or not, you know, <laughs> it's just, uh, it, it's, it's, it's with music and it's with play. And I think I've had that in me all, all my life. And in, and I was in the teacher's college um, in Chicago, uh, where I got my degree in education. And I was in a very wonderful private teacher's college that allowed us to work in creches and er, in early years, as well as, as going through the primary school and some work if you wanted to work in high school, but if I focus more on primary and creches, but that experience uh, has stayed with me all my life, you know, because what I learned there, I didn't realize how important it was at the time. So sometimes you don't realize when you're in college, what you're getting, the wealth of information and <laughs> you get to work with, but playing and seeing how children respond using ORF instruments and all sorts of different things with very young children and seeing how they respond has always been there. So to go into early years work was like a no brainer in, in a sense, you know, because I, we tried to, to find the artists. And when I was working with Barbaro, I started working with Barbaro actually as a board member in 1996 when it became part, when it became Barbaro. And then I went, uh, I became the artistic director in 2001 and left in 2015. And it was, 
per, I was in the right place at the right time with the right skills. I was just lucky, absolutely lucky. I, you know, and I had sort of come to Ireland thinking with my husband saying, be nice to work in the arts here. And every time I turned around, I got something. So, you know, you never know when you're in the right place, take advantage of it. It was just amazing. And meeting all the wonderful artists along the way and being in a community like Galway. And it wasn't so overwhelming like being in the States, like in Chicago or something, you have so many people, but here in Ireland, it's just grown. And everywhere I turned, something would happen. And I suddenly was doing something I didn't realize I was doing, but you know, and, and that happened with early years, going to Italy to look with somebody said, go see these shows. They're really good. They're for really young and you like the young children. So I went, I went and I went to a meeting and within an hour I was signed up for, for um, a funding kind of project with the EU for early years work in, in Ireland. And I didn't, I thought it was just like a little, a little, like a little club or something. And then I turned around and I was looking at all the information that was being given to me because they were talking a lot in Italian. And I realized this was a four year EU project and we were going to get quite a bit of money, you know, and I went, oh, that's nice, you know, so <laughs> it just but propelled me into into being in part of this program where we had to meet part of the whole thing with EU projects is the fact that you work with other you have EU partners, and that creates a united Europe. So when you're with the, if you go into anything like this, you realize a lot of your time is going to be taken by meeting with people, but Oh, gee, it's really too bad because you have to travel to their countries, you know, but it's, you know, but it's nice. And so um, I think from then on seeing that gave me the gift of seeing all this work that was being done for years in many other countries that were really dedicated to early years and the experimental work, the dance, the music, and being able to bring some of it to Galway and introduce it to our artists here. And uh, it's just it just exploded, you know, it just, it's just, that's just it. It's just so beautiful when you see people wonder, well, what is a really young child going to get out of it? You know, you've got to really start to look at children when they watch the show. It doesn't have to, the early, the younger they are, the non-linear it can become. And it's like jazz. It's like, you know, it, it's just wonderful and it's beautiful, but you see them engaged. And so, you know, on some level, it's magic. You know, it's just, they get it and they're fully into it. And it's just an exciting, and a really exciting feel for many artists. They said, I'd rather do this than anything else mm. because it expands my own artistic, um, you know, knowledge and, and experience. And I just love it. So I think I've said enough. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's lovely. Thank you. And yeah, it'll, um, I definitely would like to come back to your your work with um, Barbaro as we go. Okay. But first I might come to you, George, um, to hear a little about, about um, I mean, Fiona has already mentioned Bjog, but maybe you could tell us a bit more about your own background prior to that and how you came to be working in the area. Yeah, sure. Well, um, so thank you so much for, for inviting me today. And it, it's brilliant to be here and to hear all the, the, the stories of, of everyone else, actually. Um, so it's exciting listening to you, Lali, as well, because you're speaking very much to, to where I kind of came from. Um, and same as Fiona, back in 2010, uh, I was invited to become part of the, the Biog project, which was a pilot at the time. And I, my background was an actor pretty straight up I wouldn't have, at that point I wouldn't have even said I was even a maker or anything it was literally give me the script I was doing loads of improvisation and those are those are my kind of things so I kind of uh, I remember Emily Fitzgibbon who's the the director of graffiti at the time and I had a chat with her and I just said I, I think I'm the wrong person for the job like I don't know anything about this age group and um I just think maybe you, there's someone else you know better and ultimately um herself and Sheila were, were great they just kind of said well look why don't you just give it a go I said well I, all right I can do that and what has happened was was something really immense uh, in terms of my own creativity my growth as an artist um my growth as a performer um it, I really never expected to gain the wealth uh, the riches fr from working with this specific age group and we we are specifically birth to three um they're very honest so you can't you know you're present and if you're not present then you might as well 
get the boat because they're not interested. So it really forces you to be in the moment. And there have been just incredible experiences as, as Lally kind of, I think, spoke to there, where you, you have this moment with, with the child. They speak so poetically. They're continually inspiring you. Once you're working with them, I would, any artist I would advise, please take an opportunity and just engage with this age group because they will give you far more than you could ever imagine. And to echo what Fiona is saying, improvisation. If you haven't done it, if you're afraid of it, just do it. It's, it's, so, it's so good and it's a, a, an incredible skill set to have with this age group as well. Um, so here we are, 2021. <laughs> I continued with the project. I adored it. I was at my best in terms of creativity across all aspects of my, my work. And, you know, uh, my role in graffiti developed or in Biog, sorry, developed. Uh, I became like a, sort of a mentor for new artists coming on board. I was very keen to, to kind of uh, look to creating workshops. Uh, which we did with Fiona and Inga for the childcare practi practitioners to ignite their own creativity as well. Um, and all that has kind of grown. And last, last year, I suppose, an opportunity arose, which um, I never, and have always said that it's the role that I never wanted at all. But perspective, having a child <laughs> of my own um, and timing, uh has, has brought me here to become the the director in in this bizarre covidness that we're all in as well but it's actually really brilliant and it just seems right for now so mm -hmm. it's been an incredible journey thus far so and one i'm, I'm looking forward to, to continuing to be quite honest that's great thank you and congratulations on your your new role thank you <laughs> It's not an easy feat to take on a new a new job amidst COVID. I know a lot of people have been in that position, so um, well done. <laughs> um, I might come back to you just staying on um, Bjog Fiona and to hear a little bit about, I suppose, um, your experience of uh, coming to Bjog with the musician's background and that collaborative experience that you spoke about and working with other art forms and how that sort of shaped the work that you were um, making for an early years audience? Uh, well, it's interesting because I suppose, again, coming from the performative background, uh, coming into the Bjog programme, it almost seemed like something that was just getting more narrow and more one dimensional because of the riches of the kind of interdisciplinary world that we were in. And because I was quite new to theatre, I mean, I, you know, going to the theatre is quite a different thing to sitting beside a theatre artist and saying, OK, what's happening now? And they're running around and they're doing all sorts of mad stuff. And I'm thinking, I'm sitting there with my hands folded going, not sure what I'm supposed to do here. <laughs> um, but one of my early formative experiences with Emily, where um, we were in a room working on a piece, uh, an early years piece, I should say as well that I did a lot of work as a composer with, with the Biog programme outside program with graffiti with some of their early years productions and in one of those situations we were all sitting around and it was just theatre artists and then me in the middle and um, having no experience and uh, she just said we're we going to try something here and people started moving around doing things and she looked at me and she said play and I was like play play what do you want to play an instrument or play a, I you know I had no idea what she meant by that but I quickly learned um, what was required and it was amazing because it was like she was pushing me off this cliff into the unknown and saying, well, just do what comes to you, do something. And I have to kind of gather myself and think, well, what would I be doing at home with my three kids under three that I had? Um, or what would I be doing? You know, we'd be just doing things in the moment. We'd be doing things that just occurred. So it's getting into that space, I suppose. Um, and as a musician, that's really freeing. And I also kind of discovered that was more me than a lot of the stuff that I was doing that might have been pre-prepared, like George mentioned about, you know, looking at a script and just bringing yourself to it, obviously, but very much sticking to that. That whole kind of world opened as to what was possible vocally, instrumentally, being as a support to something that was happening in a theatrical context or in a visual context and all three together and mixing them up and changing them and kind of widening the palette I had in terms of what I would do texturally or vocally or whatever. All of that changed quite uh, 
remarkably and fundamentally and kind of remains in that kind of space now, you know, even though, and the work kind of went further than the Bureau program afterwards and that, you know, I was doing a lot of mentoring, facilitating and working for the companies and institutions and so on. And each experience brought more of that kind of challenge. Off you go, try this now, which is brilliant, you know, so I suppose it's just that thing that kind of propels you. And it is, as George says, that kind of uh, thing of being with the young audience who say, okay, well, show me what you got and we're not going to hold back in terms of our response. We let you know very quickly if this is working or not. And that putting you to that is, is, is really good because then even when you're rehearsing or even when you're developing work, you're always thinking about that, that kind of bar, that very high bar that young audiences will hold you to. And I think that that's kind of crucial in terms of work development and crucial in terms of how we think about ideas and how we, how they all manifest. You know, I think it's really, really important. So I think that's become really important. My children are all in their teens now, they're in their teens. So they're no more used to me in some ways, but I, I still think, you know, you have that kind of, they were great for balancing stuff off, but you know, we're back to just ourselves now, but it's really great to have had that experience. And I suppose as a musician, it has kind of changed me utterly in lots of ways. And I'm really delighted to be in this world. And I think anybody that comes into it, I haven't met anyone who says, oh yeah, I tried it and I didn't like it. I mean, it's one of those things, you try and you, that's it really. You don't mm. go back. So, so yeah. Yeah, that, that does seem to, seem to be, absolutely. Yeah, no, that, that does seem to be the um, the universal experience to, to people yeah. who, uh, who come to the work they they don't want to leave <laughs> um and fiona just said there if, if i can just mm. add to that that so as you mentioned fiona's background is, is music then we had inga who is a visual artist and myself under the, the theater banner or whatever but um ultimately we didn't know where one discipline started and one discipline ended we 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 were just before you knew it inga was performing fiona was like uh you know making things and we were all that was really exciting and we were just challenging we were being challenged and challenging each other in in ways that we just hadn't sort of imagined and you know i would never have said you know that i could play an instrument if you was like oh yeah just grab that there and do something I'm like, what what do what and the same thing so we we all have the same sort of experience of jumping off that cliff but geez what, what you land in is just a bed of wonder and and you know just gems it was really exciting you know uh, to go there and and do that yeah that's that's lovely and um looking back on uh because i there's a lovely um little video documentary i saw that you've made about that pilot phase of bjog on the graffiti website which i had a look at and um it's lovely it does it really gives an idea of how that collaboration sort of started um, so do check that out if anyone wants to have a look. I think it's on the graffiti website. Mm. Um, Lally, I'd love to, <laughs> I see you, you want to jump in something. anyway. I was going to come I, to you. Absolutely. I, think, um, I don't know if you, you remember this. I came to watch you at, I think it was a, uh, Bernardo's class and you were the three. Oh, yeah. You, yeah, you had the visual artist as well. And you were doing a scene, you did this whole thing where you came blustering through a door why am I thinking there was hay involved or something? But uh, you know, I might have been the hair. <laughs> I was delighted because not only did you have the kids with you, you know, all the children playing and, and eager to believe right there, right in front, you know, that we were, you know, all these these people, what they were doing. But there was such a, a synchronicity about it because there was there was the theatrical element then layered with the music and then the visual came out and the teachers were all participating. It was just so beautifully unfolded, you know, and it was just, I thought, gosh, that's great. And I love that the teachers participated. I love that they saw what you were doing because they, it, it just stopped that whole feeling of teaching in such rigid kind of ways and just kind of being able to trust and flow and seeing, oh, a child was doing that. Let's put that into the mix, you know, and just, it's really that whole kind of improvisational thing, which my background is very strong in as well, that I can see that kids really love that, you know, and it opens that, you know, it takes away that fear of participating. Mm. It's really good. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Great. Great that you still remember it. That's a good thing. Yeah, that's brilliant. Oh yeah, it's memorable. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And speaking of teachers, Lally, um, yeah. 
I suppose when you started programming this kind of work um, in Barbaro I, that you might have encountered um, in other countries around Europe, mm -hmm. How did you find the experience of, of building audiences for that kind of work? Did you ever find yourself in a position of, uh, I suppose, needing to convince anyone that, that, yeah. that this kind of work was possible? Yeah, uh, it was interesting to, to the first outlay of it. First of all, we had kind of built an a, a, a reputation in the sense that people were wanting to come to see what it was, you know, were curious. And if they had babies or they want to, and sometimes you meet parents who are so keen to get their children into the arts to see the arts, they were, there was no hesitation. I mean, I, honest, we had one man bring his two week old baby to see a musical performance, which was brilliant because it was made for big, really young infants. It was a cellist and um, um, sort of did, he did, he did flute and other kind of little little beads and stuff like that but they were like this and they put the babies on the rug between the two beautiful show from belgium and the babies were there you know crawling back and forth and looking at each other and the music started started and they stopped and they were mm -hmm. looking at the cellist and at the at the other gentleman with the flute and the in maybe crawling toward the cellist but they were just mesmerized and the parents are going oh. you know look at this. that's my baby you know the music stopped the babies took a breath. You could see it. You know, okay. And then crying and everything, crawling to their parents. It just, they were so engaged. It was magical. And then I had seen that happen in Belgium and I thought I got to bring this, but it's seen that kind of thing. And just that word of mouth then goes out hmm. and it becomes everything always sold out quickly for the babies. It was no problem. The very first thing we did, we brought from, from, um, Bel uh, from was it oh, was it from the, from the north north of, and Belfast yeah and it was uh, the baby rave and that was done up there <laughs> yeah <laughs> and okay so we had this big <laughs> gymnasium you know and it was all set up for this baby rave and people said what is this you know we there were so many people lined up it was like a rock concert you know people <laughs> our parents with all their infants and buggies. And uh, I had a photographer come in because he was checking out and he says, okay, I'm going to, he says, so tell me how this works. And I go, uh, what do you mean? I, I, and he says, no, well, how do, do you line up the babies or what do you do with them? What happens to them? And I, I go, what are you talking about? You know, there's different sections. He goes, well, no, for the race. He thought it was a baby race. <laughs> <laughs> I almost wet myself. Really? No, really. It just was, I couldn't stop talking. I couldn't breathe, you know, <laughs> because I was just trying to imagine this idea of a baby race you know go and the parents all cheering them on you know but um but that's the kind of thing you know people just didn't know what things were but the parents loved it they just they didn't want to leave you know because they don't get out often and this was <laughs> and everything was so well geared for them and experiencing their child in a new way mm. and new parents especially with the infants mm. they loved coming in and finding this is another way to engage with their child so mm. I never had a problem selling the baby shows. In fact, people were like crying, saying, ask, calling me personally and saying, surely you must have a couple of tickets hidden away. You must have, I promised, I promised <laughs> could take my, I promised my friend we could go with our babies. I go, you have to buy them early. No, so it's never been a problem. Never. Mm. Yeah. Besides That's great. The, I'm the great to hear. record of births. So. <laughs> That's true. The highest percentage of babies in in Europe is in Ireland, which I was fascinated to hear. <laughs> um, and um, Ashling, it would be great to hear from you, I suppose, uh, as another programmer about um, the introduction of early years work onto the program of the ARC and how important it is, I suppose, uh, within the ARC program to have work for the very youngest audiences there and a venue like the ARC. Yeah, I mean, the introduction happened before my time, so I can't really speak to that, I suppose. But um, it's since I've been working there and it's nine years now, can't believe how did that happen? Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's uh, it's always been an integral piece. I mean, we because we go all the way up to age 12, we would often talk about not audience, but audiences, mm -hmm. you know, so we, you're always kind of striving to keep that balance. Um, what you're programming for a 10 year old, of course, has to be completely different even to what you do for a five year old, let alone a two year old. 
Mm -hmm. uh, in lots of ways, you know, even just on practical terms in terms of duration and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think um, so that is the constant juggle is that you're trying to keep all those strands going and, um, you know, you're multidisciplinary. So we're trying to also give love, spread the love between the art forms and, and the audience. Um, so, you know, th that, that's, an, uh, that's just part of the challenge of the work, really, I suppose. But we, it's, it's always part of the consideration. So if we do have a program, say we have a theatre show uh, that's for 10 plus, which we do actually coming up soon, you know, we program all their things for that earlier audience um, in and around that time. So you're not neglecting them, you know, that's really important. I was really, uh, Lally, I really recognise a lot of what you're saying. I mean, um, our marketing manager might disagree with me, but I think, you know, it's fair to say that it's the younger end of our audience is probably the most hungry um do you know and and parents um definitely yeah i mean there's just seems to be constant demand and i suppose you know it's a relatively short phase um and uh, in in a child's life and you know so that audience is constantly replenishing itself mm. like really fast you know you might you know we might have a regular a regular face of a child for a couple of years and then suddenly they're five and they're in school and they're just in a different phase but you know there's another wave of, of little ones coming up very very fast behind so um yeah and I think as well like to that point about um you know audience resistance I think I think there can be I think some people just you know didn't have they didn't have that earlier experience perhaps when they were a child you know and th and then they feel intimidated or they just feel like this isn't for me or mm. um and so what you know you often see with parents is um they they didn't have it but they really really want their child to have it you know so they they, they take the leap but they're a bit terrified you know they, they they come to something but they're a bit like i'm out of my comfort zone but i i really want my child to have something that i didn't have you know so it's i think it's a lot i think in terms of venue um experience there's a huge amount around just making people comfortable you know and and a lot of that is really basic hospitality and just creating that welcoming friendly atmosphere and you know and calm and like it's okay, you know, we know that it's a bit chaotic with little ones and, and this is a space where that's okay and, you know, non-judgmental space and all of that. And, and that goes across the board, like that's all your venue staff, but it's also the artists also conveying that similar, that you're, you know, that you're safe here, like that this, there's no, you can't go wrong, like you're not going to embarrass yourself. And, and generally, if you can bring the parents to that space and the children are so, they mirror, they mirror their energy so much, you know, it just makes for a more successful um, experience all around. You know, the artists mm. have a better time than delivering what they're trying to deliver and so on. So um, mm. anyway, I think I've gone off the point. What was your, your no, original no, question that's, there? That's lovely. And, but actually um, you mentioned the artists and that was something I wanted to talk to you about as well is the, um, the relationship that the ARC has mm. built with earlier artists and the kind of the way um, they're supported by the ARC. Could you speak a little about that? Yeah, I mean, I suppose across the board, regardless of the age group you're working with, we have a very strong practice of like just always giving a lot of support to artists um, in general. So, you know, it's I think it's to everyone's benefit when you can develop a relationship over time. Um, you know, the artist gets to know the organization and vice versa. And you can just you can go further. You can do more things together. I mean, having said that, uh, we do like we do have long term relationships with with lots of artists, but uh, there are other times in our programs, for example, when we we're doing festivals where we, you know, might only be engaging with someone for uh, a couple of days, but we still endeavor to always just kind of imbue a bit of that support. Um, and just that's, it's more of a collaborative approach, really, I would mm. say. Um, and people generally really appreciate it. I think it doesn't always happen, I think, in, in other, in other spaces. And it's partly, I suppose, because we are working with children and we're so audience focused and, um, and we're also also really trying to encourage artists who maybe have never thought about it before mm. to give it a go. Like George was saying, like she had that experience with Bjorg and Fiona, you too. Um, you know, because there is an element of, yeah, being, being just kind of going for it and trusting that you have enough skills in your artistic toolbox, you know, that you will be able to um, do something interesting and then, you know, and see where that takes you. Um, at the end of the day, you know, children are just small humans you know um, they have slightly different needs obviously to adults and it's you know it's very important to be aware of those uh, but I always say to people you know you, you still need to be the artist you are you don't need to change who you are fundamentally and sometimes people 
think that they, they have some idea that they have to turn into some like I don't know happy clappy kind of it's you know the worst kind of children's entertainer cliche you can think of mm -hmm. um and that's no you know that just doesn't work for anyone especially the artists probably so you know I think that's fundamental it's like it's not it doesn't have to be that you completely changing who you are it's like maybe like Fiona was saying it's exploring another aspect of your or discovering another aspect of yourself as an artist a new strand of your work mm -hmm. um you know and, and yeah a, a space where you can maybe do things that you can't do with older audiences um, and that can be quite freeing. So I suppose, yeah, across the board, that support of artists is really kind of fundamental. Um, and then I suppose just to give a couple of examples, in recent years, uh, we actually set up a, an er a very specific early years uh, residency, mm -hmm. uh, which is a year long opportunity for an artist. Um, uh, thus far, we started with a visual artist, a wonderful artist called Lucy Hill. Uh, who we'd never worked with before so it was really exciting and now we're working with her loads her residency finished in 2019 but we, we, we've just kept working with her because she's just fabulous um and then we worked with joanna parks who's a theater artist and drama facilitator um who i'm sure a lot of people might know she's been uh, um around a long time but she had kind of had a bit of a shift in her career she'd worked a lot really with primary school age children for a long time and through various kind of organic means really had kind of started getting more and more interested in the younger age group and had really started kind of working on developing that part of her practice so she became our second earlier artist in residence um and we do have a third which is a dancer uh monica munez unfortunately mm -hmm. poor monica's residency has been put on ice thanks to covid but we're really looking forward to finally getting it off the ground soon we hope um, but we've also been doing other projects. We got a bit of support from the Department of Children last year for a project where we commissioned a visual artist called Jane Groves, and she made two sculptures, sculptural works for the very young audience. It's actually the first time we've ever commissioned visual art specifically mm -hmm. for that age group. And they are now currently living in two preschool settings. Mm -hmm. She's doing online sessions with the staff to support them to engage you know to help children to engage with the artwork in lots of different ways they, they're kind of companion pieces they have uh, nature themes and yeah so she's just giving them loads of ideas about you know themes and i you know interests that may emerge for the children but generally just encouraging the and supporting the staff and following the children's interests which kind of lines up to what laddie was saying as well that you know you can just you can you can flow with where the, where the where the children are kind of what they latch onto I suppose when they when they experience some piece of art and you mm -hmm. can kind of take that somewhere I, th I think that you know thanks to the Ashtar framework that is the way a lot of earlier practitioners are working which is wonderful so mm -hmm. there's that natural sense of that organic flow mm -hmm. and, and many of them are are really comfortable with being creative which is just wonderful so mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And um, George, I suppose um, Björg would have a lot of engagement with um, within childcare settings and mm. crashes and, and work with a lot of um, childcare workers. How does that work take shape and what has um, what's that engagement been like? So, well, the, the, the engagement uh, has it has been everything for, for Björg, really. Um, interestingly, what what the COVID um, restrictions have gifted us mm -hmm. is a real opportunity to engage with childcare professionals very much like what you just spoke about there Ashley that um, we can't physically get to the children mm -hmm. which is really difficult uh, because we don't know what how the experience is going we don't know we're relying on on the the feedback from the the childcare professionals so we have 10 that we're working with closely at the moment and we're, we're running a weekly sort of hour long workshop. Um, some is one on one, some is with two, you know, it, it's down to their timetabling, to be honest. So it's not something that is sustainable, you know, across the board, but um, it's working really, really beautifully. So we are gaining really great insights mm -hmm. uh, into the, the, the challenges for childcare professionals currently, but you know, in terms of their time, in terms of resources. Uh, so like that, we, we kind of, we set them a, a, a simple task within a session, uh, as in within a Zoom session. And so they get, them, uh, they get 15, 20 minutes to just be totally creative in a breakout room with an artist. 
or two artists, whatever it is. And the the feedback so far has been like, you know, someone said this is like an oasis. You know, it, it's food for my soul. I, I get to actually, I can just forget about everything else and just be present. And ultimately what they're doing is they're igniting their own creativity, but they're always thinking of the children they're working most closely with. Mm. And they're kind of being very specific about, oh my God, I have this one child, she's really into this. And I think this is how I can reach her and, and get her to, to come out a little bit more with the rest of the group. But like, there's really some kind of big things happening, which is very, very exciting. Um, so, we there's a loss a sense of loss for for us not being able to be with the children obviously mm -hmm. but this has been a really so far we're not finished yet so all the findings will be will be uh, most interesting but um being able to have this really close meaningful uh collaborative experience with the childcare professionals i think has really really been um it's something re really valuable and important to hold on to going forward mm. um because I think they're getting to, to even understand more the value of the creative arts within the, the early years, you know, and the, the idea of the process. It's OK. We don't need to have an end product. We can see what's happening to the children when they're they're exploring with these different you know, materials or, you know, like like you said, actually, like looking at a sculpture fantastic that you know that's 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 brilliant why not you know why not you can you can present the most complex concepts to this age group and you'll find the core very quickly and then boom it all just takes off you know and um, some childcare professionals have got uh, projects that they're developing already like so they're working in a way how the artists have collaborated, how we work to create the experiences we bring in to the childcare setting, but they're doing it on their terms with what they have and with the knowledge they have of the children they're working with, mm. you know? So there's something really, really, um, I'm getting all tingly now, <laughs> I'm telling you. It, it, there's something really brilliant and exciting about this. So it, it's, it's, I want to mind it and, and bring it forward um, mm -hmm. somehow for sure, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know does that answer the question you asked I'm sorry yeah, no absolutely <laughs> and really we want to get back to the children we want to get back in with them yes but, of course but I think we can do it now in in a much more collaborative way where all the adults are totally invested and playing that we're all playing mm -hmm. for that 40 minutes or however long it will be you know mm -hmm. that's really exciting yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. okay I I just want to say that that um, I'm, I'm doing some work right now with some teachers uh, via Zoom, and what you're saying is 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 so true. I, I've had throughout the years, I've always had teachers call me and want to know that could I, you know, could I give them uh, a name of a book or something else because they'd like to do drama in the classroom or something like this, you know. And I said, well, I said, well, do you like drama? And they go, well, not really, you know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? but they thought but, but if I have a, I, th I think I should be doing it with the child mm. you know with my class I said mm. well tell me what you like and I have for example I had this one teacher who said well she loves crossword puzzles and I said well have you ever tried crossword puzzles you know you love it that's where you come from and she said no I said well, well think about it you know think about how you could in put it through in history you can you can make it make them big make them small make them huge around the room you know find a way to really play with it and she's she got so excited then she started throwing ideas at me I said that's where you have to come from when you're teaching you know it'd be nice if you could teach drama but if you don't like it it's not gonna don't feel forced to do something mm -hmm. you don't like to do start mm -hmm. at least from where you are you are this person so if you have a, a teachers who I mean, I mean, how many of you have taught in a workshop where you have teachers come and do like a little teacher workshop and they're terrified? And uh, I, I once stipulated that there were to be, there were not to be any chairs in the room when the teachers came in. I didn't want them to sit down, you know, <laughs> sitting and we're not going to have that kind of workshop where they take notes. You could take your shoes off. We had movement. We had lots of other things that we did together, but I wasn't going to let them sit down and they had to play and they had to learn play improvisational games and explore the idea of just playing and story building together as a team. And this was, and this is, this goes along with what you were saying there when teachers can have the opportunity to get away from being, you know, a teacher stuck in the old way of teaching. 
mm. you know, and let and realize that they are still creative beings themselves and let themselves trust that and let themselves see it and recognize when there are moments they can take it forward and just watch how the children respond and be able to go, oh, we're going this way. That's interesting. Let's do that. You know, that's, <laughs> that's the kind of thing you want to be able to do with confidence. Mm. Yeah. I really like what you were saying there, Hannah. That's great. Mm. An interesting thing was, which is slightly the opposite there now, but one of them said, uh, she came back and just, she was very honest and she goes, I was allergic. <laughs> <laughs> I was allergic to doing it. But I said, but you did it. And she was like, yeah. And I said, and how was it? She goes, yeah, it was good. <laughs> so like, I was, I just thought that's incredible. You, you were allergic. You were obviously taken out of your comfort zone, yeah. but you said, feck it, I'll, I'll go, I'll give it a go. And she did do it. That's and uh, like, that's amazing. If you can, if you can take that little bit of a leap and obviously you have your colleagues with you as well, you know, so yeah. are they with you? Are they against you? Are they supportive? Are they kind of going, what is she doing? Um, I just, that was highly commendable. I was like, you're brilliant already. You're doing like, your work is, is excellent mm. for being allergic <laughs> and just going for it. I thought that was, you know, I thought that was the job well done for sure. You know, it was really nice to just mm. go for it and see what happens mm. and discover what, what you learn, you know, mm. discover what it is that you're drawn to within this allergy or whatever, you know, <laughs> But anyway, so that was another nice sort of positive result, you know. Mm, yeah, it's lovely to hear that. Um, not to. Interesting, actually, I was just going to say if that's all right. Just about sure. when we're kind of working over Zoom and the whole COVID world and what it's brought us in terms of the challenge, um, you know, to have childcare practitioners learning and being creative in that kind of context is amazing. But I suppose true to the youngest audience true to their resilience recently Ashley and I worked together in the Big Bang Festival and I went through quite a, a series of challenges from the point of view of the technology and trying to perform over Zoom which we did myself and Irene Buckley for a concert for that fabulous festival and afterwards I was thinking to myself yeah this feeling of elation is quite similar to what one might have um, were we at the end of a, a concert where we were in the arc with all of the great support and collaborative things that you'd have there in that immediate environment we had all that on zoom somehow we managed to get it together and do it we had amazing support and managed to get to the children of course children um, early you know children in the early years on zoom are who they are no matter where they are so they were just being themselves and it was amazing we were able to reach out we were able to talk to people we were able to say oh look at you with your blanket look at you dancing around the room and it was amazing to have that i'm thinking this is such a strange world to be in but we were mirroring that experience and it was quite fabulous. I it was. was. Really Thank you, Fiona. Fun. Fiona was a stalwart. It was a real challenge with the technology. Oh, I've aged about 10 years with the technology. <laughs> the, payback, the payback in the performance was amazing. Both Irene and I were yes. like, you're Reason. right and it was it was that connection with the audience you know that we could see them and, and my favorite was there was two little girls I don't know I think they've been in Galway and they were in a tent and they were watching they were joining into the concert from a tent which I imagine was in the back garden or something or maybe it was even in the sitting room um but it was just so delightful because it was just that thing of children being children and and yes yeah. there they were with us and they were obviously having such a great time so it, you still kind of got that feedback in a in a very different way but you still yeah. had that sense of dialogue with the audience which was yeah. is yeah. what it's all about really it was such a comfort as well it was such mm -hmm. a comfort to know that actually you can maybe recreate that to an extent and like trying to hone that in i mean it was a long period of work but so rewarding mm. when we could actually do it in real time and you know yeah i was on my own in this room going oh that was great but what a fabulous experience you know, yeah, like, and to have those, I mean, those children that they were there, they had their feet up in their heads, and they were looking at the screen, and they were talking to us, and they were, it was amazing, it really was. So, I suppose you'd have to be encouraged by that yeah. you know, in these times. That, and they are the audience that will come that will connect with you most, mm -hmm. I suppose, most vividly and 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 in, in the strongest way, mm -hmm. on the, or on any in any context, they will give you that very strong response so we you know it was it was a, a serious learning curve and a really rewarding one so thanks for that Ashley. Not at all, Fiona. thanks as all for you <laughs> it's so encouraging to hear that um that 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 work is still connecting i suppose with people because you've also done some work with um direct vision centers fiona 
has some of that taken place over Zoom as well? Yeah, in fact, George and I, with um, the artist Rachel Doolan, who's a fabulous artist working with the Bio Project as well, worked on a project called A Little Bird Babble, which was the idea of Rachel and both George and I supported in that. And it was a postal project, actually, primarily, um, as opposed to um, a digital project. So we were sending packages in and we did some video recording, which was also given to them to play over whatever uh, medium they wanted, whatever interface they liked. So it was delivered in that way and we did get some responses. Obviously, it was a slower, less immediate kind of uh, path in terms of getting responses. And then I suppose our normal way of working is that the response comes at you and, and, and you respond again. So it's that very quick in the moment thing in, in terms of an audience or even on Zoom. But this was different. This was a slower snail mail, if you like. Um, path, but really rewarding getting lots of things in the post and sending back thing, things back and forth and um, very well executed and really well received actually it was really a beautiful project to work on um, and you've got that extra layer I suppose of care that you want to put in there in terms of the context um, you know for the children and the parents and what they're what they're experiencing so there's that as well and I done some work in centres but this was a kind of a I suppose it was a more heartfelt, poignant experience in some ways, and we really wanted to get as much response as we could. And they, you know, so we were getting a lot of feedback from the carers. They were the kind of conduit through which we were getting a lot of the responses. And they were really great, actually, to help us kind of say, well, here's the next move. Come back and give us more of this or give us more mm -hmm. of that and so on and so forth. But a beautiful project, a really, really nice one and encouraging. Do you think that we can... I suppose adapt you know in all sorts of ways and the children again in the situation were amazing the richness of the responses George I'm sure you'd agree absolutely yeah we get some beautiful like even even like the, the drawings that came back yeah. they're, they're getting their parents to help them take photographs of some of the uh, they were like doing nature artwork and things so it's, it's very transient so they were taking the pictures and they were just really uh, invested and you know you might get a little voice message saying you know we really enjoyed this and it was just um and we, we, we knew that uh, there had been some new arrivals of, of babies as well. Mm -hmm. So we thought, OK, we want to try and support the, the parents somehow, you know, and to just take time to kind of slow down and just stop and go outside into the this particular centre has, has beautiful grounds. And so we were encouraging them to just, you know, it's like giving permission you know it's like just go and take 10-15 minutes and just sit with your baby and listen to the breeze or you know it was very kind of simple things like that but um you know yeah it, it was it, the there was a lot of tears I remember when we'd get the post back because some of it was just really um just very touching you know and, and I think at that time it was during the first kind of part of the lockdown where we're all coming to grips with what was going on and mm -hmm how can you be creative and you know uh, i don't know was, anyway um so yeah it was it was a very uh, important um a project i think for, for for many people for many different reasons i think you know so yeah mm -hmm. sure and it was eight weeks i think in in total um but yeah mm. that's lovely yeah it sounds it sounds like a really a really lovely project um and I am with uh, two direct provision centres currently as well. Sorry, and they're mm. they're engaging on in terms of um, they have artists collaborating with them through Zoom on particular projects, and then we also have them uh, uh, engaging with us on the, um, uh, the the workshops that I was just describing there earlier on as well. Mm. So um, that that's happening as well. But again, it's all through Zoom and dropping things off, you know, dropping materials mm -hmm. and things like that. So yeah. Mm nice to have be able to have some tangible elements as well though um not just the digital as fiona said i really like the the snail yeah. idea yeah yeah um great well um i'm not sure if we have any questions in yet but if any of the attendees would like to pop any questions into the q a um please do and we might um uh, we'll come along to those next. Um, it'd be lovely to hear if there's any questions that people would like um, addressed. But um, before we do that, um, it would be really great to hear um, a little bit more, George, about the um, training that Bjork offers to the artists. Um, I really liked what Ashling said earlier about 
uh, having to sometimes reassure the artist that they don't need to change the artist that they are mm. in order to engage in the work. Um, are there specific, I suppose, elements to that training or, or skills maybe that that artists uh, that need to be imparted to artists so that they can start undertaking work with this audience? Yeah, I think there's there kind of are, I suppose, but um, this is a really interesting question now, considering, mm -hmm. again, you know, uh, the world that we're in. Um, I remember, and Fiona would have experienced the same, uh, or the same exercises, but experiencing them very differently, I guess. But uh, we had some really beautiful exercises that we did in the in the early stages with uh, with Emily and, and Sheila. And it's very much about, uh, it's around looking at things with fresh eyes. So you're, it's not that you're trying to, you know, be the child or, you know, it, it's kind of just, looking at things I suppose with um a different perspective you know like focusing in on something you know really really tiny like you know I don't know there's a little hair clip here but if you actually start investigating that like you, who knows where it's going to take you you know so there's something in that where you're just focused on something and you have a space to be able to just uh to just explore creatively because that that's what we that's what we do that's our the job um and I think you can, it's in, in encouraging everyone to, to go off, think of the big idea, think of everything, to, you know, don't be, um, certainly do not be stunted by the, the thought that, oh my God, but I can't do that because this is for a one-year-old and they can't have that or what, you know, no, you go there, you investigate it all, you check it all out and then you start working back. And it's like, I think I mentioned it earlier on, you can have a huge idea, a huge concept, but you will come to the core of it. You'll come to the essence of it. And that's where you start. That's where now you start working in terms of the, the audience. Mm. So that's kind of where, and, and the audience specifically, it, are, is it for babies? Do they move or, you know, are they not moving? Is it, you know, are they whatever, two to three or whatever? But it's like, it's working from, from that point. So it's encouraging that freedom to, to as as you say be the artist that you are and you know we just brought on nine uh, sorry we have nine artists currently which is the, the, the biggest amount we've ever had mm -hmm. and seven of those are are completely new to to mm -hmm. yog and there's a variety of experience with with early years as well and we've all been on zoom all the time mm -hmm. so that has been an immense challenge um but surprisingly I guess the creativity is still there where we're still collaborating we're utilizing breakout rooms we're giving this space uh, and, and that's where the workshops for the childcare professionals came out of was that we, we thought okay this worked for us so let's see if it can work for for others as well and collaborations are happening between artists creating pieces mm -hmm. uh, which is how Bjog has always worked as well um, the one thing that is absolutely missing for, for the new artists on board is that they have not yet engaged with mm -hmm. the, the earliest audience, which is who this is all for. But what they are gaining is a different sort of insight, I guess, by collaborating with childcare professionals. They're getting a very detailed insight into very specific rooms, I think. Um, but it's very different until you go into the room you know I think that that's very different so, so in a way the training is not complete until they get to actually go in and and experience that um but uh it's just about yeah gu guiding um and and not making sure that everything is remaining as open as possible I think mm. you know and it's really hard when you're in this little box as well to keep things open you're not in a studio you don't have space you're working in your bedroom you know so trying to trying to keep all that um in perspective try to keep it alive try to change things up is um is part of the challenge but um you know artists came on board only in early March like it's nuts to think that we're like we've just been at it just over two months it's been a very intense uh journey for everyone but also quite incredible and we're coming up to the final part like at, at the end of the month the project will be wrapping up 
and you know all the fruits of the labors will be um will be there and uh already it's kind of mind-boggling to see what has been achieved under these the circumstances mm. so taking how we've worked prior to covid and taking how we we're working within covid i think going forward there's there's going to be a bit of balance between both there's there's mm -hmm. there's positives out of all of this mm. yes. pandemic mess uh, that we can really take forward and that, that are really really beneficial i think mm -hmm. the thing mm -hmm. you know yeah um, but yeah the absence of the the children is is definitely felt for sure mm -hmm. yeah for sure um, lovely. Thank you for, for sharing that with us. Um, we have got a few questions in. Um, the first one comes in from Superpower, um, wonderful theatre company. Hi, guys. And they ask, um, what advice would you have for artists looking to make early years work for the first time in terms of process? And how is it different from work for young people in general? Hmm. Anyone who'd like to speak to that, Lally, maybe? One of the best things to do is to see work, to see as much work as possible, to see the, di the diversity and have the chance to speak to the artists. The mm -hmm. artists love to talk about their work, so there's no problem, really. If you just, just be brave enough to say, I'd like to talk to you about works, your work, because so many artists come, from, come into the work from a different place. And sometimes when you see the work, you go, how did they manage to do this? How did they know? that children would engage with this, mm -hmm. you know, because sometimes it's so abstract. It really can be like performance art sometimes. It's just way out there. And it's it's interesting because I would, would have thought that parents would be, what is this? What is this? But instead, when they see their child riveted and watching, laughing or engaging with some, you know, I've had, I just remember this man once there was a jazz concert. These guys were great, you know, I think they're from Amsterdam. And they had all kinds of nice visuals to set up how they played the jazz as well, but they were babies, they you know, like toddlers, and they were just like watching and rocking back and forth. And this one father leaned over and he said, My son loves jazz. That's so cool. <laughs> you know, and that's and no, but and then he just you just don't it, it it's really hard sometimes to put into words. It's really something you have to experience and watch the children. I had this other man once and he didn't want to bring his child. He says, oh, no, he's too young. You know, this, oh, no, please, you know, come because he had done some favors for us. So I went with him and, and it, it happened to be a very funny show. His child was sitting on his knee laughing his heart out, just laughing. Just, and the father looked at me, he goes, he has a sense of humor. I didn't know he had a sense of humor. You know, so <laughs> you can discover things about your children. And that's so wonderful. But to see the diversity of work work that some people they have dedicated their lives to this for years for a long time so when you see the diversity and how and how exciting it can be and how not necessarily childish it's just interesting you know i don't know it's just like it's like a dream you know how they put something together and it might not be linear but then all of a sudden you find out you think about it you think well there's something about it that's full but it's not mm. linear as we know theater, you know, it's not like that. And it's not mm. playing down and it's not like, hi kids, you know, it's not one of those. You know, it's really, it's really different. And there's a unique sophistication about it. So many people that, you know, they all like to think they're really cool because we're doing something that nobody else understands, but babies, you know, <laughs> know. but it's really, you just have to give it a go. You just go see it, find out, you know, where, where, <laughs> funding travel there's funding available to go see things and to go mm -hmm. explore talk to the artists go to the festivals where they're performing go you know and try to see if you can talk to them and see the shows and watch the audience you know just, you just have to you have to see it to believe it that's all mm -hmm. yeah. which is very true and festivals are so wonderful for that because often you have the opportunity to watch to experience different so many different work in a in a short amount of time yeah I, I was just going to jump into the, there to say that a lot of the well-established theater um festivals especially for children including Bavro, do really good and uh, delicate packages because sometimes yeah, people sometimes people can feel like oh i have to have a child with me to go yeah. to these but you know they could feel 
uncomfortable about it. Yeah. So uh, just to say that's pretty well developed, particularly on the on the theatre side. Um, I know Belfast Children Festival do it as well. Imagine it, if you can get there is great. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, but you know, also go to your local art centre. You know, a, an awful lot of the, the local art centres, thankfully, are doing more and more work for children, which is just so encouraging to see. Mm. Um, but also, maybe if you're really keen and if you've got an idea, you know, talk to the local crash and preschool, see mm. if you can try some things out in front of children, because yes. that that's really key, I think. Mm. Put mm. it in front of the audience, like even just a seed of an idea. Um, yeah, before you do that, maybe go and see lots of things and talk to lots of people and um, yeah, we run we run um, artist coffee mornings. So anyone mm -hmm. out there who is a, an artist or an aspiring artist, you can come along to those and just meet other people and meet our staff and you know those kind of things. I think just to get yourself thinking and talking and immersing yourself a bit in what what this might be for you and what kind of what's kind of exciting you about it would be a really good start. I think mm. the, there's an organization as well that you know is involved in. I was, I was very proud to be part of what the small size project as the EU project. Now, there is a small size organization. It's an international organization. I, I can't remember. I think it's about, I don't know how many hundreds of people who have joined it all over the world. But they have, you know, you look for a small size. Uh, uh, I think it's just called small size big citizens was the original thing. I'm, I'm a member of it, but I, I don't go look at, it at, the, at the, the website anymore. But um, if you and I think they just had a festival in Bologna that was one of the the key uh, partners in this whole EU project that uh, we were Barbara was involved in that really gave us the funding to really bring in artists from all over the world, but also we got to see work the work that we saw, and that's why I keep saying if you get a chance to see the work and talk to the artists, go to a festival once in a while. And there's so many, there's places to look for that. You can probably, Barbara would have a very good listing of the festivals. They mm -hmm. should, because uh, I think we always had them available. Uh, I haven't talked about I think um, Acetage is another one as well that would have a, yeah. a listing yeah. as yeah. well. Exactly. And the beauty of now is that a lot of the festivals are still online, which means you can go to a festival anywhere in the world and it yes. just costs you the yeah. price yeah. of the, like you said, mm. actually delegate pass or whatever, you know, and you still get to engage with artists. So, yeah, um, yeah they just finished the one, I think it's uh, this week is finishing the one in in um, Bologna. Bologna, yeah. Mm. And that is a wonderful festival to go to. And the artists Definitely. all work and live in there. Did you go? Oh, yes, yeah. Fiona, we got an opportunity to go in the first, like the first year of, of Bjorg and uh, it just, yeah. I, it, I, it was uh, life affirming and changing Everybody really says, yeah, yeah. The, how they, how they respect the child is just absolutely mm -hmm. wonderful. The, the theater is for the children. Everything is for that. It's really, really wonderful. And uh, the shows that we saw, how the, the children are treated as the audience as well. They're brought in first. They're just the, the level of respect is really is just really stunning. Um, and the, the quality of the work. So, yes, uh, just to, yeah. to second only what you're saying, Lally, for That's sure. One of the best it, it's one of the best to get to outside of here. And for they sure. have workshops and conferences. It's really yes, well yeah. organized, really mm -hmm. well organized. It's worth it. And yeah, these guys are lovely people. Lots of fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about it later. Great. Well, I'll see you there next year. Hopefully, we'll be we'll be a little freer to move then. Um, there is another great question which has come in um, from Linda, and she has asked um, how best we can nourish these skills in children in in a home setting at home as as parents and caregivers. Mm, that's a good question. I think it comes down to just being open to to play. I just say play. It really is like you know, um, it's if you think of a cardboard box, you just present that to a child, and the cardboard box is going to become hundreds and hundreds of like there's endless possibilities. It, bring the element of music, as I say, what I learned from from Fiona, like you, we we have music in us, we have rhythm, we have a heartbeat. That's a rhythm, you know. You can sim you can start there and then see where where it goes uh, but it's just about being open and really listening just really listen mm -hmm. and you don't need to guide so much I think as as, as parents I think yeah maybe we, we guide a bit too much or uh, we might um we might be saying no an awful lot as well so it, it's maybe having a time 
whether it's 20 minutes where maybe you don't say no so much and you just see what happens and you, you let it get messy or you let it go a little bit, you know, um, I think that might be something really uh, nourishing for, for, for both parties mm. is my, my toughness. I, I agree with the playfulness is, is so, is so important, you know, and, and the smallest thing can become uh, an object of attention, you know, um, you know, having a pen that comes to life, you know, and playing it with the child, having anything that you might have around. I have this little bell, I, I carry it with me when I teach a lot and just, and if I do this, you know, this, it just, it suddenly becomes like something like this or just the moment of playing with little children in a way that they know you're playing and they'll play with you. Even mm -hmm. the infants will respond to, you know, the, your, your expressions and laughter and joy and dancing with them, you know, putting on the music and dance, just really just, you know, be playful and mm. that's, that's the first start of it and seeing what interests them and they go oh do you see oh is there something in my cup oh, I think there's somebody in there can you see him oh yeah I see him okay yeah you know you just go <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah I really loved um I know that uh one of the Björk artists George got um yeah. made some little um instagram videos uh for ideas for kind of sensory play um mm -hmm. that people can do at home which mm -hmm. i spotted on the graffiti instagram anyway yeah. um how did those how did that work come about do you know so if if would, would that have been a paper puffs and things yes like ah yeah. yes they were actually um from the, uh, the Department of Children and Education, as it was last year, they uh, ran a pilot uh, bursary program, which I think, Ashling, you were part of as well. Uh, as it happened, I think six or seven of the Beog artists received the bursary through graffiti. And so it was during COVID. So there was um, a number of videos made that was, they, they were just about creating, you know, the paper, paper puffs, which is such a simple thing, but they're amazing and uh just uh, you know ideas of how to play with them just little inspirations basically and that's it but that's it was just yeah thinking thinking on our feet and that's how little bird babble came about as well was like okay what how can we what can we do basically so mm -hmm. that's where they um came out of and subsequently then for for this iteration now of, of Bug, we will also have some um video um inspirations that that we've come up with as part of this you know, uh, again, I keep talking about the pandemic because we're in it. <laughs> um, so, you know, we would never have considered much doing video work or anything like that before, whereas now we're mm. going, okay, there's, there's actually really good value in this in terms mm -hmm. of parents at home, you know, you could, anyone around the world can access it and you're just inspiring. And if you can do that with a video, then great. Mm. You know? And great that so many people who will be able to engage with it who might not have exactly um, yeah. before that actually uh, leads on nicely to another question which has come in uh from susan barrett uh you may note that she has the same surname as me um <laughs> i did say that probably there would be some questions in from my family um and uh susan is wondering uh if she said she'd like to hear a little bit more about um experiences of engaging children and families who are more marginalized and who might not have the usual opportunities to access the arts how do you make work accessible to families who are living on lower incomes or maybe don't have a history of accessing the arts ashling is there maybe um are there uh, ways that the arc are maybe trying to reach um families in those kind of situations that you could speak about yeah, I mean, we, uh, like um, Bioc, we have been working with a direct provision centre for quite a few years now. Um, and I suppose, like, with, you know, a lot of the time, you, you try and find a way to reach families through an agency and organisation who knows them well. Um, so we began really with a small pot of funding to do some workshops, which we did in the centre. Like, you know, it's, it's often about kind of meeting people where they are initially. And it is really hugely about relationship building and building trust, mm -hmm. because once that's there, you can do lots more. Then the world kind of opens up, um, and and you're having those conversations about what it is that they, you know, once they get the spark, mm -hmm. and they they get that this is something really enjoyable, and uh, they want more of it. Um, 
you can start to kind of follow their lead a bit more. You can you can have that sort of more of a concept, you know, constellation bit of a formal word, but you know what I mean? You can have more of that dialogue. So yeah, we found out pretty quickly that most of those families, unsurprisingly, wanted to get, wanted an opportunity to get out of their centre as soon mm. as possible. Mm. So it didn't take us too long to actually be able to migrate them to come into the arc because that was actually like, you know, for them, that was just like amazing just to get out mm. of the kind of dreary environment that they're in and just feel like they were part of the world and mm. not kind of shut off so much. So, yeah, so we ended up doing kind of more work in our building with, with that particular group, um, perhaps more quickly. In other settings, you might just end up staying in the community, you know, mm. um, depending really uh, on, on what's possible. I we're not attached one with the other it's really about it's really about the engagement and it's about the art and the children mm. um one interesting thing from covid has been that in some ways it's kind of opened that up a little bit for us in a way because mm. there isn't that intimidation factor to the same degree perhaps um and we can make things very drop in very very relaxed uh, maybe a little bit more easily than we could if it's formally happening in our space or we're trying to set up a time in a community center or you know so there's just and people are um responding to that I mean like I think all of that work is it's long term it doesn't happen quickly mm -hmm. and it is about kind of developing relationships yeah and building trust and also nurturing artists along the way as well to feel comfortable working in, in different contexts Mm -hmm. um uh but generally speaking if you have those kind of child-centered skills you know it's it's another group of children ultimately you know um mm -hmm. and i think it's just it is really important it's really really important to reach out as much as possible um to different groups um but you need to do it in a very um very much in a sort of yeah in a, in a sort of dialogue context i think you know you're not parachuting something in you're not mm -hmm. just um enforcing something thinking you know that we think this is a good idea you should do this that's not what you want to be doing really um mm. yeah and i suppose as well for us we work hugely with schools and a huge percentage of our audience actually come from desh schools which are uh you know schools in disadvantaged areas so mm. that's another way i suppose in our general work that we would be addressing marginal uh, audiences um, mm -hmm. and that's the great thing about schools is because everyone is in a school so mm. it's uh it's wonderful but we've we've developed a program a, a lot of schools in the immediate vicinity of the arc are in that category because we're right in the middle of the city center mm -hmm. in dublin um so we have a, a particular program called an access program that we've been developing over the last few years with um particularly with those schools and we really want them to feel like it's their space, you know, I mean, it is literally in their neighborhood. So that's hugely important. And um, we have a couple of um, different strands to that program. We, we started bringing in preschools into that, into that as well, which has been really exciting too in the last couple mm. of years. Yeah. Great, that's wonderful. Um, there's also um, city councils and county councils um, are doing more work in that regard as well. Mm. Just to um, talk a bit about that, Dublin City Council uh, ran a project a couple of years ago that I was involved in a six month residency working in Darndale in Dublin, where there was a weekly visit to a preschool there. And I was partnered with Orla Kelly, a visual artist based in Dublin, works a lot with Thomas Johnston on his and his Cure Connected. Uh, work and she was in one setting and I was in the other in the same area so we worked with two different settings with a very committed uh, group and with the great centre who were just you know they were there meeting us kind of and collaborating the same way as we would in any centre as Ashley says ultimately like they're a group of children and it was just you know we were kind of put into this place for six months given the chance and the space I suppose to develop a relationship over that time which is the critical thing really mm -hmm. and, you know whatever evolved evolved I mean the projects went really really well for us but it was really nice to go to an early years setting that was we'll say outside of Cork the real capital the etc. center of the world mm -hmm. itself off into another place and mm -hmm. um, another group of children and um, so really it was lovely to be kind of in a different setting that had just a different set of values, different set of supports and see that ultimately the results are the same when you, you know, which was really lovely to see, actually. And the supports were amazing. And I think those kinds of things are very powerful as well. Residences where you have an extended period of time is a really nice way to connect 
mm-hmm. um, whether it's a duo or whether it's a solo. But in those contexts, I think that they're particularly powerful because you have a chance to build those relationships. And that's kind of key, particularly with the workers, particularly with those people, the professions that are there on the ground working every day with the children. They're giving you these great insights into what will work, what won't work. We have great feedback sessions that we're very interested in setting I was in. We had recorded interviews afterwards and these were all kind of catalogued and we had written, we had written up questionnaires. So they had a bank of amazing information and data gathered from the work, which was able to inform them about their own practice and how they might take the work forward, which I think was huge. Mm. Lots of ways. And we were all put to that kind of structure that they had, you know, very much put in place, which I thought was a really good thing. And I know we did a lot of that in the big program in the early days as well. Just that sense of kind of, you know, all the time reflecting and looking as you're going. And I suppose for them in particular, they really wanted to see how they could be empowered to deliver the work themselves once that residency was was, was over. Because as Ashley said, you don't want to parachute in, do something, and then, you know, you're out of there and the work finishes. Mm-hmm. You want to try and create a situation where you're kind of in the room, but then you're sort of slowly moving out of the room and almost looking in the window, and it's still happening, despite the fact that the artist isn't. So you want to just keep empowering and keep kind of sharing and facilitating and saying, yeah, you've got it, you know, I'm on the way out, but the work will continue. It's hopefully the result, you know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah. yeah, That's lovely. I was just going to say the same thing as, as contact to Arts Council. There's, there is quite a, quite a bit of uh, interest from the various arts in county councils as well. Um, and I don't mean just the main arts council, I mean your county where you live, you know, find out what they have. And what's available or, or express an interest because there has been quite a bit of funding that has gone out for working with children and younger children and artists and, and going into crashes and the whole thing so mm-hmm. there is a move on that and it's just the it'd be nice if the parents knew <laughs> you know it's kind mm. of hard to get the word out sometimes but it, mm. it is and even even if you have a local venue or you know a, a local arts center to find out what they're doing because so many of them around the country now are, you know, doing special things with 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 early years because it's it's like this lovely, you know, new wonderful bright thing that that's come to them and they realize they have the opportunity to have that family grow in the arts at their center. So mm-hmm. why not do it? You know, mm-hmm. yeah. And, and to look at different how other organizations, um, star catchers in Scotland and stuff. You know, how do they grow and how do they get support from their from their communities as well you know mm-hmm. that's that's a that's a really good one to look into yeah yeah absolutely um well as i predicted um we're we're running out of time um yeah. i would love to have chatted to you all for much longer um and i'm sure everyone who's tuned in um would as well and we didn't manage to get to all of the questions but i don't want to keep people for too long because i know that the zoom fatigue is a real thing um so I just wanted to say thank you all so much for joining me today um I really appreciate the time that you've given and all of the insights that you have so generously shared um I hope that everyone tuned in found it interesting and engaging and um as I said the recording of the discussion will be up on the out of orbit festival website over the next couple of days so um you're welcome to share that and share share the knowledge um after today um thank you for everyone who who zoomed in i know that we had people from all over the country and further afield um as well which is lovely and one of the one of the silver linings of uh, the situation that we find ourselves in today but i do hope that we can do something like this in person where I can all buy you a coffee or a pint afterwards to say thank you as well. Um, So thank you all so much for coming and um, hopefully the conversation will continue. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thanks very much. Thanks everyone. Lovely to see you. Bye. 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 Bye.